Luke, always nice to come down and have these chats with you. Johnny, pleasure to have these chats with you every couple of weeks, mate. You're the only person I know that puts up with me talking about sport, which is great. Better than a girlfriend, in some ways. Good week, bad week for English sport. Start off with the bad, I think, first. Uh, rugby. Last week, or two weeks ago, we spoke about Martin Johnson and how he was going to save the England squad. What's gone wrong? It's... I, I wrote in my blog, actually, I analysed quite a lot about the first game, you know, the England uh, victory of the Pacific Islanders, what they needed to do to conduct their games. And it was in the contact area, and it was in the backs. It's decisiveness, decision-making, and it's aggressive. And it, it, honestly, it just it comes down to that. We are still doing that passive defending where we're waiting for the opposition to come onto us, tackling them over our shoulders. It means you're giving them three or four yards, which allows them to be constantly going forward for their forwards. That's a lot easier than running backwards. And it's a nightmare. You watch the Aussies, every hit they were making, and against the Kiwis and South Africans, you'll see it more. They're trying to knock us backwards, turn the ball over, and it's turning defence into attack. We need to learn to do that. But, yeah, there are major, major problems in the back line at the moment. It is a new back line. And, you know, things don't click overnight. But um, I'm a bit worried about Cipriani not performing. Danny Kerr looks very good, but he keeps taking about three or four strides when he picks the ball up from the ruck sideways before he passes it, which is setting the whole back line going laterally instead of forward. And everyone knows rugby's simple. Run straight, tackle hard, pass backwards. And you've got to look at the key decision makers. You've got to look at Cipriani. Flutie, I think, in the last ten minutes against Australia, you know, played like his life depended on it. Why weren't the players doing that in the first 70? It's, it's, I've still got confidence, and I think Johnson, again, it's like Peterson, he's saying all the right stuff. He's, he's saying these kind of things, and he knows where we have to address it. I just would like to see us almost go back at this stage, even if it was kind of like to where we were in the World Cup, where, OK, we might not have the flair, but at least we were playing with passion and heart. And it, I'm not saying that the England players aren't. It's very easy to sit here and criticise them, you know, when they're losing to Australia, one of the best teams in the world. But you do feel that there's, there's something missing from that side at the moment. Hopefully, Johnson will kind of find what it is. But there's also been some good news. Last night, England were victorious in Berlin against Germany. But what do we know today that we didn't know yesterday about this England squad? Firstly, um, that Fabio Capello is one of the best things to ever happen to the uh, England national side. To see guys last night, fringe players who you know have never really established themselves internationally before. Uh, you look at Stuart Downing, Michael Carrick, I thought Jermaine Defoe and Gabby Agonhol had great games. Ashley Young looked lively when he came on. Sean Mike Phillips, to play like they did, in Berlin, where England haven't won since 1971, uh, against a pretty much full strength down the side. It was amazing. Um, uh, all credit to the manager. He's got them playing with no fear. He's got them playing with confidence. And he's got them playing with pride for that national shirt. The, the closing down, the work ethic, everything was amazing. And it was what, as a fan, you want. You're representing, you know, players who are representing your country to do. The Germans did not hit him. It was such a thrill to watch them panic under pressure, not been able to string stuff together. Yeah, the goal was horrible, but you know the fact that England didn't panic, didn't revert to their old kind of kick the ball long and just stand there, and actually you know had the confidence and belief to keep to their game plan and you know go on and win it was amazing. I thought John Terry was spectacular as always, you know, as a captain. I thought Upson, who has looked awful in the past, was amazing. And yeah, I think that if you're an England fan, you should wake up this morning um, with a big smile on your face because uh, it reminds me very much of when Clive Woodward took over the England rugby team in 1997. It's going to take time, but he's, Capello is putting in place the fundamentals that I think by 2010 will make us an amazing side. That's England teams covered for this week, Luke, but I know you've got a lot of sporting angst in there, usually in rant form, so what's in the Wilkins rant locker this week? My rant locker this week is, uh, well, we talked about Cal Zaghi and his amazing win uh, two weeks ago. Um, this week was actually about Hatton. Boxing, absolutely love, I think a lot of people do, and... Ricky Hatton is one of those guys who's always been a hero in this country because, you know, he is incredibly brave, he can hit like a train, and he's never, he's never run away from a fight, you know. The problem is, is when he played, went up against Floyd Mayweather Jr., who's one of the greatest pound-for-pound -pound, uh, boxers the world's ever seen, that wasn't enough. You know, you can be as brave as you like, and he kept going forward, he kept hitting in, but against an amazing boxer, you're going to get taken apart. And it's, it's kind of funny, it reminds me of Rocky III, what's happened. He's now obviously employed... Floyd Mayweather Sr., uh, kind of like Apollo in Rocky Three. He's taken Rocky, just a bruiser, and he's trying to turn him into a boxer. I mean, Fl uh, Floyd Mayweather Sr. is one of the best defensive uh, coaches in the world. And the stuff he's got Ricky Hatton doing, unbelievable. You know, the ducking, the diving, the movement, as well as still delivering those punches, but from different angles, I think could be very interesting. I think it'll either go two ways. One, because Mal Malignali, M M that guy he's fighting, is, a, is you know, one of the best guys in the division as well. 
but it will go one of two ways. Either it will be an amazing success, Hatton will go in there and will tear him to pieces and will stake his claim for either a rematch against Mayweather or will dominate you know, the division now for the next few years again, which I think he is good enough to do, or it will all go to pot. You know, he's going to go in there, get hit hard, and he'll forget what he's doing, turn back to the slugger, and it'll still be an exciting fight. So, I hope, I really, really hope, and, you know, the sounds coming out of the Hatton camp are that he's in the shape of his life, which is something that in the past you could kind of, you could never accuse him, you know, for being, you know, a coward or anything else, but he's never, you know, sometimes his training regime hasn't been great. But he looks wicked, and I think that the nation should get behind him. It's the MGM Grand, Las Vegas, Saturday night. It's going to be immense, and, you know, with the haymaker... David Hay last week winning, and Calzaghe winning. British boxing is in a complete ascendancy, as we saw in the Olympics as well. It's doing really well. I think we should all get behind him, and I can't wait for the fight. And hopefully, when we next chat, we'll be sitting there saying, hell, just like Rocky Three, it was. And I'd love, I'd love to get a picture of him and Floyd Mayweather Sr. running along the beach together, getting stronger, a la Rocky Three. That's not just some sick personal fancy of mine. It is in a film. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. Go Hatton.